I'm going to give you a talk about the X-ray crystallography facility today and try to give you some, uh, try to help you to that suggestion to decide whether you should use X-ray or maybe go to the M facility or the NMR facility or just go, go with AlphaFold. So the X-ray facility, if you don't know, we are in a room 1S205 and next to MassPec. And I'm running the X-ray facility under the supervision of David. And Fabrice, who has already given his talk, is running the crystallization facility under the supervision of Jan. And Fabrice asked me to talk about the crystallization facility as well. So we'll tell you something about what he does with the crystallization uh, liquid handling robots. So just in case you, you are a first year PhD student and you never use crystallography. So what we do, we, we crystallize proteins and then we shoot an X-ray beam. And the function of the crystal is to diffract the X-ray beam and also to amplify the signal, which otherwise will not be detectable. And you get an image, something like that on the detector. I will explain it later on what this is. And for these images, you are able to, try to do a Fourier transform and go from the reciprocal space to the real space. And in real space, you can see the electron density or the electrons in your structure. And once you have an electron density map, you can build your model. And you get something looking like what you see in the publications. Let's say a general workflow for the crystallography project would be you choose your target, you express, purify your protein, you will try to crystallize it, you get some hits, you will do some optimization until you get some good quality diffraction crystals. You might want to cryoprotect your piece, you might want to soak some ligand, then you need to harvest, freeze the crystals. You might want to screen it in house to make sure that it's a protein crystal, it's not some kind of salt crystal, some uh, other impurity. If you want high, higher resolution data, we can go to the synchro, we can collect the synchrotron. Then you have to do data processing, you have to do your phasing, by which we'll see what they, I'm talking about, you have to do validation of your model, and hopefully we can get some interesting biology out of it. This is a, more or less what the time, time, typical time consumption, but this can vary greatly, but as, as a rule of thumb, this is what, where your time will be spent probably. So be one or two weeks to prepare the samples and one or two days to, to get your structure if you got good crystals. But of course, this one to weeks, in some cases, it could be one to two months or one to two years, or it might never happen that you can crystallize your proteins, unfortunately. Sample quality. So ideally, we like you to have a protein that once you put it down a gel filtration, we give it a nice single peak without any other contaminations. And this will what you do look like, like on a gel. We like your sample to be soluble, uh, soluble which means soluble means that you can easily concentrate it to up uh, five to ten mix per mil. And we also we like your sample to be stable, which means when we set up crystallization screening, you will at least fifty percent of the drops clear. If you see precipitation everywhere, it's unlikely you're going to get crystals. How we crystallize the proteins? There are many ways to crystallize the protein, but the preferred way in the LMB is what is called the sitting drop, vapor diffusion sitting drop. And that's how it works. You have a reservoir in the plate. You will add a bit of your protein, and then you put some of that, that reservoir on top of your protein. And there will be some uh, vapor diffusion where the water will go, will go back in the, in the reservoir because there is a high concentration of precipitants or salts. So the drop will start to shrink. And while shrinking, the protein concentration increases and the amount of precipitant increases. And hopefully this will, will cause some nuclearization of your protein, which will start to crystallize. And we use these plates where you can do 96 of those experiments in each plate using different reservoirs, 96 reservoirs. This is just to show you a bit how the, this is slides from Fabrice. This is how the vapor diffusion process occurs. So this is just a, um, a saturation uh, curve showing that while the protein increases and the concentration of the reagent increases, you're going to go from an undersaturated solution into a metastable zone, nucleation zone, and precipitation zone. I mean, the, the theory says that you're going to enter the nucleation zone, start to nuclei, start to form nuclei, so the concentration drops, so you end up into the metastable zone where your crystal is going to grow, which is probably true, but you can't really control this. That's why you need to try as many conditions as possible. 
because you never know which one is the zone that's going to give you neutralization, which uh, which uh, condition is going to give you this is a nice this can kind of um, reflect a bit of the theory there. This was a plate from Mark Fiedler. Again, this is a slide from Fabrice. So the main strategy is basically we do a brute force. We try everything. 2,300 conditions we have available. And uh, we can use a uh, mosquito, which we require you to have, uh, to do a full screen, you will need to have about 384 microliters, but probably you need twice as much as that because 100 nanoliters drop is not very advisable. You might want to use 200 nanoliters drops. Or oh, we'll also have an eco dispenser, which will drastically decrease the amount of uh, sample you will need. In case you are desperate, you don't have much sample, you can, you can use the eco dispenser, which is an acoustic way to, to deliver your, the reservoir. And I want to talk to you about a, a nice tip that has helped many people with their projects that they, I think it's good that you know about this. And it's called in situ proteolysis. Let's say you want to crystallize your protein, but unfortunately your protein has got many unfolded loops that is gonna uh, create a problem to form a crystal packing. What uh, a very powerful technique is called the in situ proteolysis, where you digest your protein with some proteins like trypsin, come with trypsin, we got uh, three different uh, proteins you can test at the facility. So once you digest your protein, you might want to run a gel and you will see something like this. You say, oh God, that's it. I destroyed my sample. It's useless. Instead, it's looking like this just because the loops are missing. But in reality, in solution, the core is still well folded and now it's ready to crystallize. So the product will be like this. You add the protease to a very low ratio, like 1 to 1,000 to the protein. Leave it incubate like for 30 minutes on 4 degrees. You let your loops go. You add the uh, protease nib like PMSF. And that's it. You just set up your plates as you do with uh, your normal sample. So as I said, we've got three available uh, proteases. Uh, the protocol is very quick and easy. So if you'd like to try it, just please just let us know. But probably, if you're probably crystallizing, we would suggest to you anyway. Um, ah, we got some example of success. This was some crystal we grow in this way. This was a, was a sample that was not giving crystals until we, we digested. And this was nice. It was very uh, complex of five different proteins. The initial it looked like that. Despite the in situ proteolysis, still didn't give great crystals. But went through a couple of uh, optimization rounds, and then we got some good, good quality fraction crystals. And to do the crystallization optimization, this is a slide from Fabrice. We have this nice uh, dragonfly robot, which uh, we can talk to Fabrice. It's very simple to use and very quick. You can easily, quickly set up uh, an optimization around the condition to give you your initial hits. So I'm going a bit fast because we started a bit late, sorry. And so if you need to do cryo protection and ligand soaking, we can help you with that. Cryo protection means that you need to add some kind of a cryo protectant into to your solution where the crystal is before freezing it uh, to, to try to stop the ice formation during flash freezing. Ligand soaking, you might want to add the ligand to your crystal. That's possible. That's very, it's a common practice in uh, drug discoveries. Uh, so the difficulty in soaking and the cryoprotection can vary greatly or depend on your samples. And it will depend on the robustness of your crystal to osmotic shocks, uh, the solubility of your ligand, whether it's soluble in DMSO, it's soluble in water. Uh, even more problems if you have to have it out on soaks. But it would be too, I mean, it's not this the place where to discuss these problems. If you will have this, if you need to do something like that, uh, we can sit down and discuss the best way to proceed for your project. Harvesting and shipping to synchrotrons. Uh, so if you don't know, this is what we use to harvest the crystal from the drops. We use this uh, met metallic base. I'll show you why it needs to be metallic in a minute. We have a pin where there's this nylon loop attached to it. This is what the nylon loop looks like. But it's also now, this dead, there's also the lithographic loops, which are, bit, are more expensive than nylon loops, but in some case, if you go very small crystal, they can be very useful. But they tend to break after one usage. You, you freeze and tow and you find that they're broken. So it's quite expensive to use them, but if you need it, you need it. Uh, so what we do, we attach the metallic base to the top of the magnetic wand, looking like this. 
So now it's easy to to move the loop around the drop by uh, holding the wand in your hand. And this is what looks like when you be fishing crystals. That's the drop, that's the size of your loops. Of course, the loops come in different sizes. You can pick the right size for the, for the crystals. And when you take it out, you fish it. That's what it should look like inside the loop. If you want to ship to the synchrotron, or you want to carry your crystal to crystal, we use this, uh, it's called universal packs or unipack. So with this wand, there's a button, release button. So once you take your crystal out to the drop, you can go inside the pack and release it. And once the pack is full, you're gonna close with the magnetic base, put it into your uh, liquid nitrogen dry shipping dewa and send it to diamond. Of course, what you're seeing here, in real life, is also it's all done under liquid nitrogen, but it's still it's not that difficult. If you want to collect in house, we go an X-ray generator, which has got two independent screens, so two people can do experiments at the same time. Uh, you will need to have a quick training session, then you can start to book it, or you just email me if you want to use it. If you need to use it, then we'll just discuss it. Don't worry. And um, yeah, how to make advance with our in-house generator. As I said, the main thing is to, you want to, once you get a hit, whether you want to spend the energy and consumable into optimizing it, depends whether it is a protein crystal or is a salt crystal. And the only way to tell this is to shoot it. So we like to fish it, put in the extra generator, shoot it, and find out whether it was salt or protein. If it's protein, then you go ahead with the optimization. If it's salt, you're back to, to screening. That's the difference. As you can see, the salt will give you very uh, sparse and very um, high intensity spots. You said the, the product is supposed to be less intense, but it will be um, much denser. Um, of course, you'll also be used, it uh, will help you to choose the cryoprotection uh, conditions. You might want to use different cryoprotection. You want to test some cryoprotection will destroy your crystal, some will destroy your diffraction, despite the crystal still looks good. So that's a nice way to optimize before you know you send your crystal to the synchrotron, which will like to, to minimize the time you spend to the synchrotron, which could be at night. Instead, here you can work during the day in sociable hours. Um, we can collect and solve structure in the house. Just you know, at the synchrotron to collect data set will be like a few seconds. In house, it's going to be overnight. So if you got many structures to do, it'd be better off the synchrotron. If you only got one structure or two to do, we can easily do it overnight. And also some beam lines are the synchro, like I-23. Uh, they don't have like robots, so the throughput is very low. I always ask you to send like a few good quality crystals so you can filter out for these good quality crystals in-house before sending it to them. Um, and also the synchro is closed like five times a year for uh, four weeks. They close for maintenance shutdown. So if you are desperate for a structure and, and uh, it's a maintenance shutdown of the synchro, we can collect the data in, in house. So see data synchrotron, we used to use two synchrotron until uh, recently, but now we stop using the one in Grenoble. We only use diamond because we've got plenty of time from diamond. Um, so there are all sorts of different uh, beam lines for to fit different needs. I will not go through this. I will discuss this when and if you will have crystals. Uh, same was for Grenoble, but we, yeah, we are not using it anymore. Uh, yes, if you want to catch time to speak, please just give me a shout. We'll we'll arrange, we we'll schedule a session there, either remotely or physically. If you are interested to see the beam lines, uh, data collection synchrotron, uh, two data collection options. I would say we can either go there, which I think if you've never been there, would be a nice experience. It's a nice place. Uh, you see, it is the beam lines are very, I mean, they're like a very highly engineered. If you are in, interested to kind of engineering uh, instruments uh, you're gonna love inside. Oh, we can do it remotely. We can collect from an uh, X-ray facility. We ship the samples, they tell us when they're ready, they put into the robot for us. So that's the robot. They put into uh, the jewel here and the robot will just mount them for us to collect remotely. Uh, okay, we already just discussed that. So data collection strategies. Uh, very quickly, let's go through a bit of theory so we will understand better the collection strategies. So exactly what's a crystal, we can describe it as a, a crystalline, 
crystalline arrangement. If you look inside, it's a crystalline arrangement. It's like a, a lattice at the point of the at the point of the arrangement, which forms at this point form a kind of lattice, which is repeated infinitely in three dimension. And this, when you, if you associate the molecule in the same orientation at each point of this lattice, that's when you create a crystal. And within a crystal, we can identify a unicell, which is the basic building repeat block of a crystal. But within the unicells, okay, I saw it. And there are unicells that are only put this lattice that can be arranged to form infinite uh, uh, lattices in three directions. There's only 14 types of, of lattice that can do that. And this was discovered actually very long time ago, actually from August Brave, a French guy back in the 19th century. And this, there are 14 Brave lattices which you can group into seven system and which are four types. The same system will be the triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, trigonal, tetragonal, hexagonal, and cubic. And you can have either a primitive, a base-centered, a body-centered, or a face-centered type uh, lattice. But within the unit cell, you also have what is called the asymmetric unit, which is the, actually is the smallest unit that can, be, can generate the, the unit cell by crystal symmetry. In fact, if you notice this, let's say your molecule is the duct. This is the unit cell. The, the actual unit cell does not contain only one duct. In this case, it contains two ducts. Each duct is called a, a symmetric unit. So this is one duct, this is a complete duct. And this is your second molecule inside the unit cell, which you, can, can only one duct, you only need one duct to reconstitute the whole unit cell just by 180 degree rotation, which is part of the, of the P2 uh, crystal system. This is what we look like when you solve the structure. If you look at the unit cell and the green, one green is one of the asymmetric unit cell within the unit cell. And it's important to know this because all you need to solve your structure is the unicell. So in this case, if you have a crystal formula like this, you will not need to collect all 360 data. You can just collect half of the data and then just duplicate those data by 180 degrees to have a full data set. I mean, this was important in the old days when data collection was as low. These days, you just collect 360 degrees because it only takes a few seconds. But it's good that you know anyway. So when I've been talking about the space groups, this, this crystal form. So when you hear it talking about space groups, space group is, is nothing else that a, a concise description of a, all the symmetry that you have in your, in your type of crystals, okay? So all the, the, the crystal symmetry that we've been talking about, they can be rotation, they can be two, three, four, or six-fold rotations. Like this was a two-fold rotation example. You can have inversions. I mean, the inversion you can see from the picture, exactly what I mean, inversion, same as reflection where you have a mirror plane, you can have screw axis, where you rotate and translate. And you can have glide planes where you reflect and translate. So let's say, for example, let's give a practical example. Somebody said to you, oh, my crystal in the space group P4122. So they're what they're talking about. So the letter at the beam is primitive. As you remember, it's one of the type of the lattices. It's primitive, a body center, face centered. And the first number is the, is the fold rotation. So you have four fold rotation. So it'd be like tetragonal. It's called what you say tetragonal because you can do like 90 degrees. It will always look the same. It this along the C axis. And that means you also have a screw axis along the C axis. So you do this 90 degree rotation and translation, 90 degree translation. But also you have two, two fold axis along B and A. That said, all this symmetry together they can form 230 different space groups. However, because the protein have a, a chirality, unlike a small molecule, like in chemistry, so in chemistry, you are likely to, to, to find your space group among 230. When you work with protein, it means that you cannot have glide planes, reflection, and inversions. What this means in practical is that instead of having 230 space groups, you are limited to only 65 space groups which makes your job much easier when you want to process and solve these structures. And these are all the, the possible uh, space group you can obtain with protein crystals. Unless it is a very, very rare, super rare special case, people will see some kind of a pentagonal formation, but 99.9999% of the case, your crystal will be in one of these space groups. 
data collection strategies, again, this can vary from, uh, as I was saying, now and, and in the cycle, it will vary because of the speed of the collection. In the, in the house, one image takes 10 minutes, okay? Two to 10 minutes. So you really want to collect. If you've got a few crystals to do, you like to collect a, as, as least data as possible for each crystal to, to move faster. So in that case, it's important to find out uh, your space group, your brother lattice. At the secret, you don't really care anymore. As I said, with 20 seconds, you can collect 360 degrees. So it will take you longer to understand the strategies than to collect the data. This is this was very useful. So in the old days, so you knew it if you have like a if your lattice was like a type two, you only need 180 degrees if you were looking down the B axis, or you need only 90 degrees if you're looking down along the A or C axis. As I say, we don't look at this stuff anymore. We just collect 360. Mosaicity. Again, it's important to estimate your mosaicity. Mosaicity is some kind of internal disorder. Crystals are not perfect. They're like a, they go like perfect domains, but these domains are not like all aligned together. This causes mosaicity, which makes your spots on the image to spread. So if you, when you collect, if you do your oscillation between, between each image, you do like a two degrees, for example, that's too much, which cause the, might cause the, the spot from the previous image to overlap with the spot from the second image. So you, in that case, you want to minimize the degrees, the, the degrees you do between, the oscillation you do between each image. I mean, the choice was between 0 0.5 to 2 degrees. These days at the synchrotron with the shutterless detectors, we can do very fine slicing, less than the normal, you just do fine slicing, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 degrees, so you don't care about your mosaicity. You're not gonna get overlaps with this kind of, um, of fine slicing. But what is a problem at the synchrotron that is not a problem uh, in the in-house uh, uh, source is the radiation damage. So you're never gonna burn your crystal in our X-ray generator. But in, in the in the secret, if you're collecting for a few seconds, you still burn your crystal. You will, now do you know that there is a nice uh, on the fly data monitoring at the synchrotron? So if you start to collect, you see your this, the red points uh, um, uh, describe your the resolution. If you see that your images, so each point is an image while you're collecting ta 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 ta. At one point, if you start to see that your your resolution, you know that your crystal is dying. So next crystal, hopefully you will have a next crystal. You don't longer just have one crystal. Your next crystal, you can either reduce the time that you're acquiring, or you want to reduce the fluxes that you are delivering from the beam. And I just would say this is, is super critical, guys, because uh, if you get a data set like this, this data are not useful. And the, there's no data processing that will ever help you to recover that. You can cut the data, use just this data. But if this data is not enough, you didn't collect a complete data set by then, there's nothing, there's no data processing you can make up for what you lost. You will just have to grow again, go back to the synchrotron. So the data collection is, uh, is absolutely critical. If you get bad data collection, there's nothing we can help you with the data processing. Now, data processing. Again, we need to talk a bit theory very quickly. So you will understand better data processing. Uh, so let's say you got only a single molecule. Instead of a crystal, you hit a single molecule. Because there is no lattice, you're not going to have a diffraction. In this case, you're going to have something called scattering. The matter will scatter the X-ray in every direction. So you will have like a cone, scattering cone like that. And then we'll give you your, we'll give you something that's called the Fourier transform of your molecule that will look something, will look like something like that. However, because X-ray diffract very little with matter, there is no way, there's no detector in the world that will be able to detect this signal. So you will never see this image, okay? This is unlike EM. EM, the electron is scattered much stronger with the particle. So you can't see this, this particle. Of course, they use a lens to project and to get the faces back. So you have to see this one. But if you get, if you, if you move the detector from here to here in an electron microscope, that's what you will see. You will see the Fourier transform of your molecule. But that's not something that we cannot see with X-ray because as I said, they don't scatter enough with the matter. So that's why we need to use the crystals. So how does the crystal help you to ampli amplify the scattering signal? That's what you do with something called the Bragg's law. 
So we know for, for every scattering light, for every scattering, scattered uh, uh, photon of, of X-ray from a matter, if this, uh, if this law is held true, so the two T design theta will leave, will equal lambda, like in this case, means that the scattering phases will be, will be so it means the scattering um, uh, photons will be in phase, okay? So if you, as you know, if the two, two, uh, two wavelengths are in phase with each other, they're just gonna uh, double in amplitude. And you can call this, this diffraction, you can uh, visualize it now to help you to visualize it with some geometry, as if there was an imaginary plane, okay? That's where your beam gets reflected by this imaginary plane. So let everything, everything that is spaced by D, every plane spaced by D will give you a construction and interference, so it will amplify your signal. Now, in crystallography, it turns out that this, uh, these planes, the interactive one, the one that uh, give you amplification of the signals, are only those planes that will cut your unicell that we've seen before in an integer numbers, okay? So if planes cutting like this, in this case, cutting four times, it means it's gonna give you construction. If it was three and a half, if it was something like this, like this, like this, and then it was only half, it would be, uh, no, it would be no, non constructing. So the signal would just disappear. We cancel out each other. So, of course, you can, there is not just this one. So, depending on how many times it's going to cut your unicell, you can give it like a, a name to this family of planes. For example, this one you can call it the D140. We are cutting the, the A edge only once, the B edge only four times. And let's say it's, it's a parallel to a parallel to the Z edge, so it's never cutting the Z. So you call it the one for zero. But now you can imagine you have many of these type of planes. They will diffract in any direction, okay? But only this, this family of planes diffract in this direction will give you a constructive signal. Only the one that's dividing the cell. And if you take all these planes, all the planes cutting the unit cell in all, in all directions, and you do a Fourier transform of that to reciprocal space, what that is going to give you is a, is a, it's called a reciprocal lattice. Now, what I'm saying here, this is that this is basically the, is the Fourier transform, or imagine all, all the possible planes that cut the unit cells in uh, integer numbers. So each of these points here represent a, a family. Each point represents a family of planes. Like for example, this point, you can call it the D140. This point can be the D210, okay? So it means wherever you have this point, you have construct, constructive uh, interference between the waves. Now, if you do a convolution of the image of one single molecule with the reciprocal lattice of the diffracting, constructing waves, you get that when you shoot a crystal in the X-ray beam, the only intensity you're gonna see from your structures, from your molecules, that has been, you know, there are like a billions of those molecules inside the crystal. You will see the image only one of those billions of molecules, which has been amplified billions of times. But the problem is you only see it where, this, where these points are, okay? <laughs> and you might not recognize this, but if I show you the next image, you, you probably recognize this. This is what you collect. Well, every time you collect data, that's the image you, you always see. And then, so what you see is a weighted reciprocal lattice. That's why if you collect in 360 degrees or whatever, under an or whatever you need, you'll be able to collect the whole molecule. So, and this, so each of these spots is called the, it's called a structure factor. So each structure factor will have an intensity. This is, you need to remember this for, Next slide, when we do the data process, we have an intensity or amplitude. Amplitude is just the square of the intensity, the square root of the intensity. It will have a phase, and it will have this Miller, Miller, these are called Miller indices for each of the plane we represent, okay? Please remember this on the structure factors. But what we are interested, we're not interested in the Fourier transform of the image. We are interested in the real space image, what the image looks like in the real space, the electron density. So how do we get the electron density? It turns out that the electron density is the Fourier transform of the reciprocal weighted lattice. So you can fully transform the, the, the density to the reciprocal, the reciprocal weighted lattice. 
and you can you can you can, you can transform back you can fully transform back to the density so my when i talk electron density that's what i'm talking about i'm sure you have all familiar with electron densities and this is the formula that will give you the electron density from the Fourier space so the transformation of the of the electron density into the Fourier space into the reciprocal space looks something like this and now as you can see all you need this is this is a summation over all the structure factors that you collect and the more structure factor you collect the higher your resolution will be and as you, as you remember before all we need to know from the structure factor is our amplitude our miller indices for each of them and our phases so how do we get these numbers so okay this is these are our image these are our structure factors okay and we want to get the amplitude the phase and the indices for each of these spots how do we proceed to do that ah just to show you that the more of these spots you have the more structure factors you have the higher your resolution will be so if you have only a few in the middle your, your this formula when you plug it the mean into this formula your electron density will look something like that if you put more numbers i put it into the summation it will start to look like that you put more you start to look like that okay you, you get better and better so now let's say you collect your 360 degrees okay now you take all these images first of all you use something called spot finding which will find the spots on the images and once you know that using the information the image uh, header info like how far the distance that the detector was from the crystal where is the beam center and what wavelength you were using you will be able to find your reciprocal lattice how do you do that i want to show you how that so imagine this is this is your all your images so, okay you put them together all the 360. if you look along one of the axes you will start to see what we're talking about the reciprocal lattice do you see it this was like a p222 he had like 90 degrees on each side okay once you have this information i know so this p21 it's got the uh, one of the angles on 90 degrees, sorry. once you have this information you will know now you know where the center is you know which one is is the 210 the 140 okay it's called indexing so now you get the index so now you also by looking at the reciprocal lattice unicell you can work out the 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 dimension of your unicell you can decide which Bravais lattice you are using and which crystal orientation you are using and now you can put the miller indices on each spot you can say this is the one 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 this is the one two one so now we've got the hkl okay we got our miller indices now now what we need next is the uh, amplitude so once we know where the spot should do should be once we know the geometry of our crystal we can predict where the spots are going to be on the images so we, we can start to find the spots and we can integrate them once we integrate them we can scale and merge and we get the intensity of each of them and then we just do the square root and we find our amplitude so now we have the edge scale and the amplitude all we are missing is the phase how do we get the phases this is the so-called phase problem in crystallography that you don't have in, e in em because you can, go, you can use lenses so you can either use molecular replacement i mean i won't waste much time on this you can experimentally this is the this is this is way to do it if you go a model it looks like your model you can use that model to get the phases to mix it with the amplitude that you experimentally collected you can even use alpha models to do this uh, if you don't have any good models you will have to do what's it called ab initio phasing so you can use like a single wavelength anomalous diffraction like sad this is what you use people use uh, um, like a, you can use systems it's called like sulfur sad you use the sulfur from the systems or you can introduce some uh, anomalous scatter like a selenium you can use sulfur you can do yeah if you probably contain sulfur zinc or iron you can use those ones and then there's other methods like the multi-wavelength the single amorph replacement which these are, are again this they're going to give even better uh, more precise phases which means better maps which means easier to build your model but they are even more difficult this one to carry out 
But anyway, we can discuss these problems if they will turn if we will turn up during a project. Let's say now we got the faces. Now we got everything. We plug everything into our equation, and we can get our density. Now it's up with, there are some uh, programs is there. You can do automatic building. If the density is good enough, they work very well. So once you do, otherwise you have to do manual building in Tokut yourself. Once you have your model, you have to refine it. You make sure that if it's chemically sensible model into the observed data, you have to calculate the best latent density to precise the model. There are different software to do that, like RefMAC, which is developed in the LMB. There are also Phoenix or something called Buster. And once you have your model, you have to validate. You have to make sure that your uh, the angles and the length of your bonds, they all make sense with what we know chemically about uh, amino acids. And to do what we are just showing you, we got plenty of the software at the LMB to do all the steps. I won't go into this into tips. If you are interested, there are some books. And I can suggest these books are all very good books. I mean, this is even higher level. If you're really interested in understanding crystallography, these are even better books. There are some very nice explanatory videos from the LMB that have been collecting during the years. Uh, me and Fabrice can always help it if you have some problem to discuss, if you can help. And there are some very good workshops now these days. They're done at Diamonds. One is a two day collection processing training, one is a seven days, the full Monty. If you're interested in this, please let me know. I can book you a spot on this. I think they run like three, three times a year, three or four times a year. You might want to go in the summer one instead of the winter one. Uh, so now the second part of my talk will be like, you know, now we are in this era where there are uh, different uh, techniques for high resolution data collection, like cryohem or alpha fold. So when you should come to visit me, Fabrice, um, it's a macro, uh, like crystallography. As we know, they were at the birth year of the LMB, macromolecular crystallography at the birth year of the LMB. It was blossoming in the 70s, golden years, a new protein for the month. Then people start pushing the really, you know, the low hanging fruit were done. They wanted to do bigger and bigger proteins, which became very difficult to crystallize. In fact, you can see that in the early years, majority were like small proteins, very little big proteins. And then people start to become less interested in the small proteins, start to become more interested in the big complexes. But still, you couldn't do many of them with, with crystallization. Those are some exceptional cases, of course. Like this was like done in Oxford in 1989. They, they, they managed to crystallize the whole virus. Don't ask me how they did. Don't ask me how they solved the, the, the process of data in those days with those computers. It's just in something credible. If you know some example from a remarkable example from the LMB, I mean, this is the most scary of all. This is just a monster. I mean, but again, it's possible, but these are like a lifetime achievements almost, okay? This day, thank God. Yeah, thank God there is cryohem now. You can, you can take over to do ribosomes because it will just crash to do ribosome crystallography. However, at the beginning, when cryohem started, you know, there were some issues. For example, they used to have like a, some area where the resolution wasn't as good as the rest. So in that, that case, yeah, I would say you, you could come to see us and try to crystallize the small domain. That's, for example, that's what we did to be, we stand one in Dave's group. But things have changed a bit now that alpha fold arrives. Because if you have a, okay, this is, let's say, before alpha fold, this was a problem, for example. Uh, this is one problem from Jan's group. They were solving this filament. The resolution was too low. They couldn't really find the tryptophan, so they couldn't really uh, find the synchronization for the, the registry of the residues. So what we did, we disrupted the filament, we made some mutation here, here, and we just crystallized the monomer. We saw a very high resolution, like to do two angstrom. We put all the residues in, and then it was easy for them just to put them back into the maps. Now, these days, probably something you do this with alpha fold. Maybe. Sometimes it falls, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, again, here, this was uh, with the egg the group. They had this beautiful map of this uh, ER membrane protein, but they couldn't build inside here. You know, the, the resolution was just too low. So, with the limited proteology experiment, uh, we, have, we were able to crystallize just this bit. So it to high resolution, and with John, he did a great job, and then he could plug it in, and they published. Again, this is just the example I was showing you before. We had a 
this five problem complex was not well resolved by him. So they had to try to crystallize this five complex. And with Zigo, we did it. We got 2.9 angstrom, and then we plug it in and we published. Again, these days, can you do these things with alpha fold? Maybe, but of course, I will try alpha fold first. It's much less work. It's probably, it just takes an hour. So that's what I was saying before. Now, if you need to do that, if you have this problem, instead of using X-ray or NMR, first you're gonna try something like, so it used to be fire two before alpha fold, but fire two wasn't very good actually. It didn't work very well. People always had to come to crystallize. But now with alpha fold, sometimes it works really well. So you don't have to crystallize. It saves you lots of time. Uh, also, there's Rosetta from the David Beggar's lab, which is similar to alpha fold. Apparently, alpha fold here is a bit better in general, but in some cases, Rosetta uh, worked where alpha fold faced, failed. Uh, so, x ray XLR, you try the NMR. Let's go from by size. I would say that uh, if it's larger than 200 kilodalton, yeah, you should try uh, EM straight away. Then, if it doesn't work, you can come to talk to us. We can try to crystallize it. But I think it's definitely EM, try EM territory. If it's less than 200 kilodalton, it's feasible. If you've got plenty of sample, you should try. If it's less than 50 kilodalton, yeah, probably X ray is your best option because you can really, if you get, you can purify the product, you can sterilize, you get crystals in a week. By the 10th day, you will have a structure. Of course, if alpha fold doesn't work. Remember, products, I would say don't bother. Go straight to EM, try EM. <laughs> it's lots of work, it's very hard. You don't want to put that on yourself. Alpha fold two, okay, yes. Theoretically, alpha fold two could succeed in all the cases with the X-ray crystallography, which are the one you know less than about 100 kilodalton. But it's an empirical process. So just like other process, you really don't know. It's like you know, in the EM, you have to make grids. In crystallization, you need to try to crystallize. Alpha fold, you need to run it on different construct, different sequences, and see what you get. Multimeric complexes. Again, alpha fold, I had the user telling me that they're like a very some complicated three different proteins complex that worked, but then I got the users that had to come to crystallize a very simple two, 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 two protein complex because the alpha fold just wouldn't work. For example, I just said yes, the alpha fold cannot do insulin because they does the fibrinage no, in the insulin, which is quite small, well represented. You know, so you, need, you don't know until you try, you don't know. No protein model for alpha fold cannot do your bonding of a small model, cofactor, metal ions, phosphorylated groups. So, for that, yes, you should come to see us if you want to see it. Coil coil structure. The problem is that alpha fold is not good at them, but crystallization also is not very good. They, they don't crystallize very easily. So, and the problem will be too small for EM. So, people are, are still stuck on this kind of This is a problem that is a bit unsolved, actually. Not a lot of groups that are still. Go many years been trying to get this little coil coil structure just the count. A small pro, a small peptide transit to associated complexes. So I, I had alpha fold doesn't work very well for this. This crystallography is quite good for this because unlike other techniques like here, where your sample is to be quite diluted, in crystallography is the opposite. Your sample is to be very concentrated. So if your binding uh, dissociation cost is only hundreds of micromolar or under hundreds of micromolar molar. You probably will still be in a compass when you use crystallography. So crystallography would help in that, that point of view. And mutants, again, alpha two, alpha two will not cannot predict allosteric changes. So if you go mutant creating a, a conformational change, probably have to recrystallize it because alpha fold will not show you the, the change. And again, it doesn't predict the conformation changes. Uh, but if you want to know more about what you could, exactly with more detail we can do with alpha fold, you should come to see some talk on the 23rd of April. Here we get some nice example from what people have been able to succeed or people are still struggling to succeed with. So these days, also, we work a lot with uh, RNA, a small piece of RNA. It's too small for KIM. The uh, alpha fold is not able to predict RNA conformation, at least not yet. Um, what's phosphorylation? If you've got like an interaction between peptide, so this peptide interacts with this product only when there is a phosphorylated site. So this, it works very nice for crystallography. Of course, for small ligands, is a, this is like a drug discovery project. 
I think the crystallography is still the method of choice because you can screen many compounds very quickly. Uh, also, we start to work a lot with uh, Jason's group where they do this uh, unnatural amino acids. I mean, this is a very weird structure to look. If you do this kink on this amino acid, it's very weird. But of course, this is something that the alpha fold cannot do because it doesn't understand the natural amino acids. And okay, thank you very much.